I've entitled the message for this evening, What the Bible Means by Impute. What the Bible Means by Impute. Is anything too hard for the Lord? He's not going to act contrary to his nature or to his character. He cannot act contrary to who he is. That's who he is. But is anything too hard for the Lord? Is it too hard for the Lord to take me with my history and make me stand before him with a perfect history, having never sinned. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, let a man so account of us, let a man so impute to us. Let a man reckon us. Let a man number us. Let a man so count of us as of the ministers, the servants, the under rowers of Christ. That's the lowest form of a servant. Those fellows who are down in the bottom of the ship with the oars. The lowest form. And we are stewards of the mysteries of God. I love that word mystery. I love the mystery of Scripture. <laughs> A mystery is that which we could never have known had not God been pleased to make it known. It would never have been known apart from Revelation. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. The mystery of the resurrection. This is a scriptural phrase. The mystery of the resurrection. You think of how mysterious this is. That decomposed dirt could be raised again to eternal life. Would you have ever known that without the Bible making it known? Think of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the spiritual resurrection, the mystery of the resurrection, the mystery of his will. Do you know we actually know God's will? And I'm not talking about I just want to know God's will for my life. You know, I, I don't want to be uh, harsh, but I, I, you're up to your neck in it. Uh, I just want to know God's will for my life. Uh, whatever's going on, that's God's will for your life. Um, that's the way it is. God's God. He's completely in control, but he's made known to us the mystery of his will of redemption. This is the will of him that sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. We know his will. I know the will of God. The mystery of the church, the two shall be one flesh. I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now, this is mysterious. This is mystery. I'm united to Jesus Christ. I have been so eternally. So is every other believer. What mystery? Union with Christ. This is not something you can grasp. You just believe it. All the mysteries of the scripture are not something that are intellectually comprehended. You just believe them. You expect me to just swallow that? Yep. It's God's revelation. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. What a mystery that God spent nine months in a womb. And that he came out on a certain day. And that he lived 33 years on this earth. The first 30 years being in utter obscurity. Nobody knew who he was. His brothers and sisters didn't get it. They had holiness, perfection, living in their home. And they didn't see it. Oh, the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. 
the mystery of the faith. Now, a steward is one who's responsible for that which does not belong to him. The manager of a farm would be a steward. Now, let's take your retirement savings. Maybe you don't have any yet, but if you do, think about this. Maybe you're looking forward to retirement in the next five years. Um, what would you want of a steward that took care of your retirement money? What would be real important to you? Brilliance? Eloquence? Faithfulness. You don't want him stealing your money, do you? You want him to be faithful. It's required in a steward that a man be found faithful. More on that next week. See the word account. Let a man so account of us. Let a man impute this to us. Let a man reckon this to us. Let a man number this of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. When Paul says, account of us as servants and stewards of the mysteries of God, he's not saying, count us this, even though we're not that. He says, count us this because that's what we are. We are ministers of Christ. We are stewards of the mysteries of God. Impute to us what we actually are. Now that helps me to understand this thing of biblical imputation. The imputing of righteousness. God imputes righteousness to me because that's what I am. How can that be? God doesn't impute righteous to me even though I'm not. Stay with me. He imputes righteousness to me because that's what I am. Now the question is, how can that be? And let me remind you how I uh, introduce this message. Is anything too hard for the Lord? As long as he's not acting contrary to his attributes. I love that scripture reading we just had out of Isaiah 45 when he called himself a just God and a Savior. He's both. He's an absolute just God and he's the Savior of sinners. What does the Bible mean by impute? Now, I'm almost embarrassed uh, to tell this story again because many of you have heard it on numerous occasions, so bear with me. But I'm going to give a personal story uh, where this thing of imputing became real to me like it never had before. A personal experience. In the fall of 1988, I became very ill. I'd been feeling bad for several months. And then one weekend, I got on the scales, and I'd gained 25 pounds in two days. And I said, Lynn, am I gaining weight? And uh, she said, I was swollen, uh, very swollen. I was having terrible headaches. As a matter of fact, the reason I have this shunt in my brain right now, it's because of those headaches I was having. I was having encephalitis, and it was terribly painful. I had what was called nephrotic syndrome at the time, and it was caused by uh, lymphoma. They didn't know that yet, but um, they put me in the hospital, and I was having these terrible headaches that were unbearable. And um, while I was not totally aware of what was going on, some people came to me to say goodbye to me. Some of you were, did that. Some of you were there. And when that was happening, I knew this is not good. What is going on? And I heard the machines beeping in the background in the hospital room, and I thought, this is my last night here on earth. I'm going to die tonight, and I'm going to stand before God. And you know what I did at that time? Am I saved? 
do I know the Lord? Am I a believer? Will I go to heaven if I die tonight? Will I stand before God and be accepted? Or will I be rejected and sent to hell? I thought truly in my mind that within maybe two hours, that's the thought that was in my mind, I'm going to see God and stand before him in judgment. And I started looking within to try to find a reason to think I was saved. I was looking at evidences, things I either I did or didn't do, and, and things about me that would think, well, God's done a work of grace in his heart. Look, he's this, he's that, or he's not this, or he's not that. I started looking for evidences to uh, give me some assurance that maybe I am saved and I will be in heaven. I was a preacher at this time. 1988, we started this church in 1982. I was still a preacher, and I was looking for these evidences. And you know what? When I looked within my heart to find an evidence that I really was saved, I could not find one. Not one. I looked at this part of my life. I looked at that part of my life. All I saw was sin. That's it. And I thought, I am going to hell this very night. And I remember hearing those machines beeping, and I started crying. I thought, I'm going to hell. There's no hope. I'm going straight to hell. There's no hope of me being saved. I see what I am. And this scripture was brought to my mind. I didn't hear this audibly, but I heard it in my heart. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute, there's the word, iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. And I saw clearly at that time that everything I I thought about myself was true, and I didn't know the tenth of it. But God didn't impute it to me. He didn't impute it to me. How can that be? If I did it, how can it be that he did not impute it to me? That's how the Bible Describes this blessed man. What if I came up, what if I committed, well, let, let's just make it real personal. What if I murdered one of your children? And I came up to the judge, I said, guilty is charged. I did it. But don't impute it to me. Don't impute it to me. Don't let it be charged to my account. What's the judge going to say? Lock him up and throw away the key. No judge would allow anything like that to be happened. How is it that I can be so sinful in myself that I couldn't find one thing in my heart that would make me think, one motive, one desire that would make me think, I'm going to be in heaven. Couldn't find one. And yet my hope was that all those things were true, but here's my hope that it was not imputed to me. God did not impute my sin to me. Now how... Can that be? And another way to put it is, how can God be just and justify the ungodly? How can he be a just God and a Savior that we just read about in Isaiah chapter 45? How can God be just and justify the ungodly? Now, I know when I saw that, I had peace. And I was, ready, I, I was ready to die. Bring, I'm, I'm going to stand before God and be accepted because my sins have not been imputed to me. I, I'm good to go. And I was actually looking forward to death. I, it was the, it was, and the, the thought of being accepted by God, the thought of being in his presence, I loved it. I, was, I mean, I haven't had a time like that since then when I had such assurance and joy. Wanting, you know, when you need the grace, when you need grace, he'll give it to you. You think, I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to handle that. Well, when you're put in that place, you'll be given whatever it is you need. And I was at that time. But I don't know 
um, that I uh, understood it, I just believed the great doctrine of biblical imputation. God not imputing me with my sins. Now, listen to this. The reason God did not impute my sins to me is there was no sin to impute to me. Do you hear that? If I stand before God in judgment and I'm accepted and justified, it's because there will be no sin there to charge to my account. There was nothing to impute to me. He said, I'll be not, by no means clear the guilty. I was cleared because I had no guilt. Now, most people erroneously view biblical justification like this. You're sinful and God counts you righteous anyway. Even though you're sinful, even though you're a scoundrel, even though you're bad, God doesn't impute it to you. He counts you righteous anyway. That's not biblical imputation. If God imputes righteousness to you and doesn't impute your sin to you, it's because you are, in fact, righteous before him. Now, that's the great mystery of the gospel. How that this man standing before you can stand before God perfectly righteous and holy and without guilt. Now, to think that he sees you as guilty and decides to impute, not impute your sin to you and counts as righteous even though you're guilty, that's unjust. That's not what imputation means in the scripture. He only imputes righteousness where there is righteousness. I hope the Lord gives me and you the grace to lay hold of this. This word is used 124 times in the Old Testament and 41 times in the New Testament, and it's always used as a verb. This is very important. You ever heard somebody talk about imputed righteousness? There's no such thing. There's righteousness imputed. Imputed righteousness well, okay, there's imputed righteousness and then there's this kind of right. You're using the word as an adjective. There's only one righteousness. You believe that? There's only one righteousness. The righteousness and merits of Jesus Christ, that's the only righteousness there is. That's what David spoke of when he said, I've made mention of thy righteousness, even thine only. David, why are you only speaking of his righteousness? Because it's the only one there is. That's why. Righteousness. Imputed, not imputed righteousness. That's error. That's wrong. That's a complete misconception. It's not imputed righteousness. Like there's this kind of righteousness and that kind of righteousness. And there's imparted righteousness and, and infused righteousness. And everybody thinks, what in the world are you in your minds that there's only one righteousness? And that righteousness is the righteousness of Christ that God imputes to the believer. The first time the word is used is in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, when it is said of Abraham, he believed the Lord. He believed the promise God gave him. God gave him a promise. You're going to have a seed greater than the sands of the seashore, more than the stars in the sky. And the scripture says Abraham believed what he said. He didn't have any evidence. He didn't have any kids. All he had was the promise of God. And he believed the Lord, and it was counted to him for righteousness. What was counted to him for righteousness? His faith? No. Righteousness was counted to him for righteousness. He believed the Lord. And the evidence that he had righteousness imputed to him by the Lord is that he believed the Lord. <clears throat> Turn with me for a moment to Numbers 23.
beginning in verse 9. From the top of the rocks, I see him, speaking of Israel, and from the hills I behold him, lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned, that's the word, among the nations. You see, God puts a difference between the believer and the unbeliever, doesn't he? And the believer's not reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. And Balak said unto Balaam, What hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them altogether. And he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? And Balaam said unto him, Come, I pray thee with me to another place from whence thou mayest see me. Thou shalt see but the utmost part of them, and shalt not see them all, and curse me them from thence. And he brought him into the field of Zophim to the top of Pisgah and built seven altars and offered bullocks and a ram on every altar. And he said unto Balak, Stand here by the burnt offering while I meet the Lord yonder. And the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go again unto Balaam and say thus. And when, when he came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering, and the princes of Moab was him. And Balak said unto him, What hath the Lord spoken? And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak. And here, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor, God is not a man that he should lie. Isn't that glorious? How natural is it for us to lie? Do you have to teach your kids to lie? It comes natural, doesn't it? Not God. He's not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent, or change his mind, regret. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall it not, he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. Now look at this. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him. And the shout of a king is among them. And I know exactly what that shout is. It is finished. That's how God can look at Jacob and Israel and not behold iniquity. God's got perfect vision. And if there was any there to see, he would see it. But he doesn't because there's nothing there. Turn to Colossians 1. Colossians 1, verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. You know, every time I read this, I, I feel it needful to say this. Have you made your peace with God? No, he made my peace with God. And he did it effectually. He made peace. By him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes or before time alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. How God sees is how it is. Me and you don't see right. We don't see this. How God sees things is the way they are. In Isaiah 53, 12, he was numbered with the transgressors, and that's the word. That's the word, numbered with the transgressors. He was imputed, accounted a transgressor, and that's quoted twice in the New Testament Mark 15 and Luke 22, For I say unto you that that which is written must yet be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors. 
He was numbered by God. He was accounted by God among the transgressors. Now, how was Christ reckoned a transgressor? Very familiar scripture, but I'd like you to look at it with your own eyes. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 21. Now remember, this is spoken of him. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. As long as he's not acting contrary to his attributes, nothing's too hard for the Lord. Can the Lord do this? He did it. <laughs> he did it. For he hath made him sin. You notice the to be is in italics. It would more accurately read, for he hath made him sin. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He, God, hath made him sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All the sins, all the individual sins of all the elect, he bore in his body on the tree. Turn to Levitic Leviticus 16. Here's the Old Testament illustration of this with regard to the scapegoat. Verse 20, and when Leviticus chapter 16, verse 20. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation, the altar, he shall bring the live goat. This is the goat that was not offered up as a sacrifice. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness and the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. God can do this. He can take my sin and place it in that cup and have that his son drank that cup in Gethsemane's garden. And when he drank that cup, he drank in all the sins of God's elect. And he bore them in his own body on the tree. And what happens as a result? We are made the righteousness of God. The only righteousness there is. We are made. The righteousness of God in him. 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. Verse 5. And you know that he was manifested. 1 John chapter 3 verse 5. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. Now, that's why he was manifested, to, to take them away, to remove them, to make them not to be. Did he do it? Absolutely. He purged them, put them away. Now, look. Whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not. That is the history of every believer. You sin not. You sin not. You abide in him, here's your history. You sin not. Whosoever sinneth, he's not seen. Neither known. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made 
Every believer, listen to me. You are. And I wouldn't say this if the Bible didn't say it. I say this with fear and trembling. But if you're a believer, you are a part of this we who is nobody less than the righteousness of God. And that can only be known by faith. You can't look in your heart and say, yep, I think I have. No, you know this by faith. You believe what God says in his word. Now, I go back to that time in the hospital when that scripture came to me. I do not know that I understood it clearly. Uh, I understood it enough to know that my sin wasn't imputed to me. And I know the joy I got from it. But I want to understand how. And I know I can't fully comprehend it, but this word is mentioned by Paul nine times in Romans chapter 4. And I want us to close by just reading this passage from Romans chapter 4. Verse 28, therefore we conclude. This is chapter 3, verse 28. And that word conclude is the word impute. This is the conclusion we draw from all this. We conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Chapter 4, verse 1. Well, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, is pertaining to the flesh hath found? Now, is this the way Abraham was saved? Abraham, the father of the faithful? Abraham, the friend of God? Is this the way Abraham was saved? What shall we say about Abraham? It's pertaining to the flesh. I found. Four, verse two. If Abraham were justified by works, if he did something that God said, okay, I'm going to save him. That's what works are. You do doing something that will cause God to save you. Okay, I'll save him. He did it. He did what needed to be done. If Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. He could say, God saved me because I did this. And you're not saved because you didn't do it. I am the difference. You know, if you believe in universal redemption, if you believe that Jesus Christ shed his blood for all men, and some of those men will be in hell, but not you because you did something to make it work. All that is salvation by works. Nothing more. That means you've made the difference. But not before God. For what saith the scripture? That's always the issue. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted. It was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now, to him that worketh. I'm trying to please God. I'm trying to do his will. I'm trying to obey his law. To him that worketh is the reward. Not reckoned of grace, but of debt. God's paying you what he owes you. If salvation's by works, that means God's paying you what he owes you. God's debtor to none. But you're trying to make him a debtor. That ain't going to work. But to him that worketh not, he sees that salvation by works is impossible for him. But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted. That's the word for righteousness. Now here's what this means. Verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without their works. Saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. He imputes righteousness and does not impute sin. Now, is that blessed? Now, let's pick up in verse 17. Chapter 4, as it's written, speaking to Abraham, this is God speaking, I've made thee a father of many nations. He hadn't had any kids yet, but God still says, I've made you a father. You see, if God purposes something, it's done. 
It's all it's historical even when it hadn't happened yet. And that's what he says here. He says, I've made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calleth, calleth those things which be not as though they were. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, being, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, me and you tonight, right now. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses. That's why I died, our offenses, and was raised again for our justification and the reason that sin is not imputed to any believer is because Christ bore it and he was delivered for our offenses and put them away and was raised again for our justification and every believer stands before God having never sinned. May God give me and you the grace to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our righteousness before God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful and grateful that nothing's too hard for you that you can lift our sins off of us and cause your son to drink them in on the cross. And Lord, we're amazed as we hear him cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we know it's because that's what we deserve. And he took what we deserve and he put our sins away. He removed them made them not to be, and gives us his very righteousness so we stand before you without guilt. Lord, teach us this. This can't be taught merely by man. Teach us this and enable us to enter into the joy and the peace of believing thy son. In his name we pray. Amen. Go ahead.